I'm making a 3D puzzle game. Well, I was, until school made me too busy to make any real progress. But now that it's summer and school's out, I want to see how much progress I can make over the next two months. And spoiler alert, it's a lot. In case you forgot, so far we have a gun that shoots a camera for the player to teleport to. But when he teleports, he changes gravity, so the wall that the camera is on becomes the floor. But frankly, it doesn't really matter because I'm starting over. First things first, we need some player movement. And this time, I want to be responsible, so I'm going to use the new input system. And if you remember from last episode, me and the new input system, we didn't really get along. So this time went a little something like this. It's over, new input system. I have the high ground. You underestimate my power. No seriously, I can do so much to improve your game. It takes a little bit of getting used to but it isn't all that bad. Oh, okay. And a few hours later, we have some player movement. Now it's time to make the camera gun. But instead of doing the programming first, this time I started by opening Blender. And as I was modeling, I was thinking. Most games have their mechanics built into a gun, like the portal gun and well, um, the portal gun, and because I want my game to be unique, I'm instead going to make a fancy futuristic tablet. And yep, that is definitely the only reason why. And the fact that I have no hard surface modeling skills whatsoever, and couldn't make a sci-fi gun, even if I tried, didn't play any part in that decision. Once I brought the model into Unity, I made three modes the tablet can have. No tablet, viewing, and camera viewing. No tablet means no tablet. Pretty self-explanatory. Viewing means that we can move around and look to find a place to shoot the camera. And camera viewing means we're still and can look around with the camera. Teleporting and gravity switching were pretty easy too. I just copy and pasted most of the code from the previous episodes with a bit of refactoring. Now that we're essentially all caught up from the previous episodes in terms of the core mechanic, I think it's time to focus on the visuals. The game will be set in a top secret underground government facility. So I want the overall feel for the environment to be futuristic and sci-fi-y. With this in mind, I began researching how modular environment kits work. And surprisingly, I didn't find much. Usually with game dev, there are very detailed guides on pretty much everything. But this time, I was kinda on my own. Now you might have no clue what I'm talking about. Like, what's a modular environment kit in the first place? And to answer that question for myself, I opened up the game that pretty much inspired this whole project, Portal. Look at the walls in test chamber one, and now test chamber two, and now test chamber three. Notice anything? They're all identical. It would have taken the portal team an unreasonable amount of time to make a new wall for each level, when it all looks identical. So what they did, or at least I assume they did, was make one wall piece and then duplicate it and snap it to all the other wall pieces to make different sized walls. Same thing goes for floors and ceilings too. And the collection of all of these pieces is the modular environment kit. So it appears like there's only one main rule for modular environment kits, make your pieces snappable. With this information, I spent the next six hours working on a modular environment kit. And I think it turned out really, really good, if we ignore the fact that it doesn't work at all. As you can see, the floors can snap nicely together, and so do the walls. But if we rotate a floor and wall piece, it doesn't match up. So that was six hours wasted, or was it? Because now I know rule number two, make your pieces symmetrical. Then for the next week, I made literally zero progress on the game. But it was because I was participating in the GMTK Game Jam, which you should totally check out the video I made for that right when this one's over. After jumping back into it, I spent less time and made it actually work. I also made these connector pieces, which surprisingly connect the main pieces together, so there's no ugly gap between them. After this, I duplicated all the pieces and added a nice bevel edge to them. Then I unwrapped the low poly and prepared it for baking. And Blender and I usually get along, but not really for baking. So I downloaded Substance Painter. And because it was my first time using it, I got the 30 day free trial. And it was probably the best zero dollars I think I've ever spent in my life. The bake turned out pretty nice, and the texturing process was really easy too, because I could use these things called smart materials to make the object look good initially, and then paint on any details that I needed. From there, I exported the three textures that I needed, the diffuse map, the mask map, and the normal map. The diffuse map is basically just the base color of the object. The normal map tells Unity how light will interact with the object, making it look like it has a lot more detail than it actually does, and the mask map, which is like a 4-in-1 texture combo. The red channel determines what part of the object is metal, the green channel adds ambient occlusion, the blue channel does... ah, uh, something, and the alpha channel controls the smoothness, or how reflective the object is. Next I made a shader to make the purple bits glow a little bit, and I made prefabs for all the pieces. I then quickly put together a small test level to see what this looked like. And it was pretty easy to do. 
but it did take a little bit longer than I was expecting. Oh, and it also looks really, really bad, but that's just because of the lighting, which we'll fix in a little bit. Now that we have a free trial of Substance, I think it would be a good idea to try to texture the tablet. And after a little bit, we have this, which I think is looking a lot better. I'm also not loving how the camera is looking right now, and I think it would look better if I modeled it after a traditional security camera. So after going through the same process that I've been doing so far, I came up with this, which I think looks better too. And the next thing I want to do is make an actual player model, so we're not just looking at a 2 meter tall pill. And this shouldn't be too bad, because it's very similar to the process we've been going through so far. First things first, I opened up Blender and started blocking out the main shape of the player. I want the player to be in a skin tight wetsuit looking thing, because I don't think having regular clothes would fit the vibe of the game well. Same thing with a bunch of armor. And two, it's easy to make. And once the blockout was done, I got ready to sculpt on some details. After that, our model is high poly, meaning that it's fine to look at in Blender, but it can seriously slow down the game if we put it in a game engine with everything else. To get around this, we do something called retopologizing the mesh by turning the couple million phases into a couple thousand. Now it's fit to go into the game engine, but we lost a lot of detail from retopologizing. So we need to take the detail from the high poly mesh and put it on the low poly mesh. And this is done by baking out a normal map. However, there's just one tiny thing we need to do before we bake our player. We need to cut them up into little pieces. This is because our oven is way too small to fit an entire person in it at once. Ha ha ha, just kidding. Well, for the second part at least. We still have to cut them up into little pieces. You see, textures are 2D images, and our player is a 3D model. So we basically need to skin our player in order to wrap around our 2D textures on it. This process is called UV unwrapping. Hmm. They never tell you making video games is sometimes more violent than playing them. After the bake finished, it was time to texture. And I found a nice smart material, made some adjustments, did some painting, and I got this. Our player right now is looking a little silly, so we need to pose him. But in order to move his limbs around, we need some bones. So after that was done, I gave him two poses, standing and crouching. Remember, we never actually see our player move, so we can just get away with these poses and not have to waste any time animating. And voila, now our player's in the game. I experimented a little bit by giving the player some hands, but I thought they looked a little sus, and even more sus when you look at it in the scene view. So I removed them. The one thing that I'm not loving about our player right now is the instant teleporting. I think it would look a lot cooler if he just dissolved in and out. So after making a dissolve shader, a new player model, new materials, lots of spaghetti code, and bugs, we have a super cool effect. Next, I randomly decided to make our player move like a normal person instead of Usain Bolt on steroids. To do this, I was just gonna fiddle around with the max speed value until I found a realistic speed. And instead of being lame and timing things with my phone, I wrote a test timer script to give me the exact time and speed it took to travel 10 meters. First off is sprinting. And at the start, the play can run about 7.5 meters per second. And for all you bloody Americans out there, that's about 17 miles per hour. But to my surprise, people can physically run at that speed. So he isn't moving like Usain Bolt at all, just an average athletic person sprinting. After fiddling with the numbers a little bit, we now have our player running around at a much more comfortable pace. Walking and crouching were both very similar to this process, so I won't bore you with the details. Even though the 9.837733 seconds of crouch walking were probably the most entertaining 9.837733 seconds of my entire life. Now that our player looks good and can properly move around, it's time to revisit our modular environment kits. Because, let's face it, it looks awful. And like I said earlier, it's all because the lighting isn't set up right. So I made a light by doing the same exact thing I've been doing all video and adding an area light component to it but it just wasn't working. Multiple days of research and bashing my head against my keyboard led me to find out that setting the HDRI sky to no texture isn't enough, and that you actually have to set the sky setting to none in the visual environment section. And let me remind you, that 10 second fix took multiple days. And it's not even all sunshine and lollipops just yet, because we're also missing a lot of the detail from the normal map on our walls and floors. This is because we baked our lighting meaning that the light is calculated before the game is even run. Man, there's a lot of baking going on this episode. In reality, I should have a mix between baked and real-time lighting in my scene. But that's a problem for another time. I whipped up a quick test level to demonstrate all the things we were able to accomplish this episode, and I'm extremely happy with the progress. My favorite has got to be the dissolve shader. Thank you so much for watching. And if you made it this far, you obviously liked the video at least a little bit, so please consider subscribing and turning on notifications so you will never miss an upload. Click right here to get caught up on the series 
and click down here to watch the video that I was talking about earlier about the GMTK Game Jam, because we might be doing something brand new and exciting with that game in the next video. Thanks again. See you soon.